Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to uh, actually our third and last of the uh, PBBI, Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute at California State University Summer Series. Uh, this one dedicated to a new project that we just began a few uh, months ago called the Kagahu Colloquium, which is a community of writers uh, who have uh, some tie to the Azores one way or another. Um, and it doesn't mean just if you were born or your parents or grandparents or great grandparents born there, you could just like the Azores and that it makes you a Kagahu. Uh, so welcome to all of you who are following us on the very on social media and welcome to those of you following us here, uh, of course, uh, on the Zoom webinar. Um, this uh, evening, we're very, very delighted to have four uh, great writers from in different parts of uh, the U.S. And uh, we are going to focus, of course, on the writings and hopefully have also enough time for a conversation about uh, writing from the Portuguese American experience as well. And so the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, we had three sessions for the summer of 2021, and we will actually start our fall uh, spring I should say our fall and then spring uh, part of the lecture series. We will start on the uh, 1st of September with another reading from the Kagaho Colloquium uh, that will be in the kickoff for the 14 events that we have for the spring, uh, summer and then for the spring of 2021 and 2022. Again, welcome to each and every one of you, and uh, certainly to our four writers. We're very excited about uh, today's event, and uh, we are going to uh, start by asking each and every one of the writers to take a few minutes and to introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about themselves, about their uh, writing experience, and a little bit about um, their connection, of course, uh, to, to Portugal, their connection to the Portuguese uh, American or the Portuguese Canadian world, uh, because we have uh, the West Coast of both countries countries represented here uh, this evening. And we'll start with that. We'll start with our Canadian friend to the north. Uh, so I think that would be the best way to introduce to you and uh, welcome Esmeralda Cabral. Well, thank you, Denise. Uh, yes, I um, live in Vancouver, Canada, and my connection to the Azores is that I was born in Ponta Delgada in São Miguel and um, uh, emigrated with my family to Canada when I was seven years old. And I first lived on the prairies in Edmonton and uh, then moved out here to Vancouver. Yeah, and I'm so pleased and grateful that you've uh, taken us into your fold, Denise, here on the west coast of Canada, too, because it's, um, it's great to be part of this community. Indeed, and we hope to, uh, through Fresno State and our uh, recently inaugurated Bruma publications, to also be uh, a, uh, a way to uh, publish uh, uh, not only writers and not only um, some of the work that's being done here in the west coast of the United States, but also the west coast of Canada, because it seems like both west coasts sometimes get uh, fallen behind when it mm. comes to uh, attention uh, from the Portuguese world. So welcome. Thank you so much, Esmeralda. Sharon. Hi, welcome. I'm so, so happy to be here. Um, and I live in Berkeley, California, where um, I write mostly as a poet. Um, and I teach quite a bit of creative writing at Berkeley City College. Um, and I co-direct the Berkeley Poetry Festival and um, a number of other things that I have to do in the community. Um, and my connection to the Azores is, is that my grandmother's family were all Azorian. Um, and my grandmother was the one grandparent who figured so much in my life. Um, and her family came from Saint George um, back in the 1850s. Um, and they lived in the East Bay um, ever since. So, um, and I was very happy to go to Lisbon for the Disquiet um, Writers Conference in 2018. Wonderful. There was always, uh, that's always uh, awesome to have a connection to an Azorian grandmother. It seems like they, uh, they're pillars that uh, uh, keep us all glued together for many generations. Isn't it interesting? Uh, Lynette. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, I am the product of a mixed marriage, being that my dad is from Fayal um, Asuj and my mom is from Madeira. 
So people ask, do they understand each other when they talk to each other? I don't know, <laughs> sometimes. So um, I am in San Francisco. I am an English as a second language teacher uh, for immigrants, adults. Uh, I also, I consider myself a poet, but I'm working on a memoir um, about my experiences as a tsunami volunteer back and forth for 10 years. Um, and I also attended the, the first Disquiet where it was just a revelation, revelation to meet my tribe of Portuguese Americans, many of whom are saying hello in the chat. So hi everybody, it's so nice to see you all here. Thank you, Lynette, it's appreciated, thank you. Uh, a mixed, I like that, mixed marriage, you know, between Madeira and the, and the Azores. Uh, uh, both have something in common and that's uh, they're both archipelagos. So we're bo both islanders. So they must have got along really well. And so, uh, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, I also am very excited to be here. Um, I, my grandparents, all of my grandparents came from the Azores. Um, my mother's parents came when they were kids. And uh, I'm trying to find out when my father's parents came because I'm not sure. My understanding is that they had a child when they were in the Azores and then moved over. So they were at least, you know, in their 20s or something. Uh, but I'm still trying to find out. Uh, that's part of my, my goal for 2021. Um, I grew up in Greater New Bedford, uh, Greater New Bedford area. I met a doctor uh, who is an Azorian American who grew up in Toronto and I told him that I grew up in New Bedford and he's like the homeland which made me laugh um and I went to Disquiet as well in 2013 I think which was great really fabulous and yeah I'm happy to be here happy to have you and so everybody I think has that connection with Disquiet uh, one way or another uh and that's wonderful it is a wonderful program and we hope of course post pandemic that it continues uh and flourishes for many many years um so we'll start our readings and then uh, hopefully we'll have some time we're going to try to keep this to about an hour that's why I promised these four writers um and so we will uh, start with uh, the readings and then after that hopefully we will have some time for some conversation and even some questions from those of you uh, that are uh, on zoom and those of you following us on social media um we'll try to uh, get your questions as well if you have it it's a little bit tougher but especially folks here on zoom we certainly will be able to uh have you uh, ask any questions and be part of the dialogue and so we'll start uh, with uh sharon this time if we don't maybe that would be a good way it's not to have uh, esmeralda as the victim always uh we will start with uh, with uh, sharon and um uh, with her reading uh, for uh, this uh, presentation Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will start with a poem about my grandmother, specifically about her. Um, and um, it's sort of a quirky, spicy poem. And it was done in a workshop with Carlo Matos last summer, um, where we were writing the, the Avo poem. Um, so, um, um, just to say that it, this poem is, um, my grandmother might not have been the most typical um, Portuguese grandmother. Um, probably the fact that by the time I knew her, she wasn't cooking very much. <laughs> so I didn't have all of these things that many of the other writers in our group were writing about, but I have a lot of, a lot from my grandmother. Okay, here it goes. Holy tomato, dear Carlo Matos, you were told enough with the Avo poems, too much Portuguese grandma pot stirring and plaster cherub moss gathering among the kale. Or maybe we don't have enough, you jab back. What about those cosmic umbilical cords sprouting from nine fortunate islands to lands full of full bellies and misfortune and apricot trees and more misfortune and saving accounts and figs, that transcontinental Esperanto of fish stew and sweet paedolo. Why not unwrap the cord from our subtle wrists of inky temptation? 
the conundrums that my Nana never steamed up her mobile home with um, her Mai's most requested vegetable soup or with bolo. Her bunt cake form shine as unused shiny can be. You'd never guess my Nana pulled on men's trousers and climbed the barn or lay in tall grass, passing the bottle amongst her primas, singing crazy songs they made rhyme with kaboom. But there's photographic evidence. And then her elopement and annulment records with someone who wasn't peppy. Yes, she told the stories, but they all had Disney morals by the time we came around. She was scared straight into the church after little Tommy May suddenly died. Dear Nana, lying in the hospital, learned of it secondhand. Her infant daughter's tomboy days were over. And now her white leather baby shoes sit in my underwear drawer with modeling tips and thumb drives, like the daughter I never had either. We grandkids got the, we don't talk about that white gloves and the maybe we have French blood. Who knows with a name like Levera? But we also got an anti-racist novel. Her rebel rebel not completely undone by the glass luncheon plate with matching cups posse. Because she'd tell us how she told my dad to waltz with Helen the only Chinese girl in junior high waltzing class. This was the 1930s. And when the principal informed her, something is wrong with your son. She replied, she told him to dance with Helen if nobody else would. The next year, dad found himself in a class for dummies and Catholic school was the solution. Of course, she was the best Catholic mother us Jewish grandkids could ever have, as her menorah in my cabinet now proves. Yes, Nana told me that some men are not worth their weight in the dynamite used to blow themselves up. Like that principal of San Carlos Junior High, like a lot of jerks. And that's what my avo taught me the knowledge of dynamite and cognitive dissonance and how to nudge asshole men until they blow themselves up and the don't use that kind of language while you're doing it. Wow, I want that of all. That is a wonderful <laughs> poem. Thank you so much. Continue, but that was one. I just had to, that was wonderful. Thank you. Do I have time for a second one or no, please, I pass please, it? please. No, no, please. You have, you have, you have lots of time. Okay. So this next poem is, comes from a, a long manuscript that I'm writing and um, um, it's about the area in the, the, the house I grew up in, um, which was near San Carlos where my father was raised and he would come in the 1930s to this area in San Mateo to work on a, um, a, um, an Azorian owned um, dairy farm. And he was a gardener, he pulled the weeds and such like that. And he go to the, the local junior college. Um, then fast forward to the 1970s, um, um, we moved to San Mateo. He becomes the, um, the head city planner there. Um, and <laughs> The only house we could really afford there is this old ramshackle house <laughs> that we find out um, much later on was, um, well, we knew it was um, a, a dairy farm and we knew that, you know, the neighbors are still there um, who are also Azorian. Um, and, um, but then we learned many, many years later that that was the actual farm he worked on. So it's sort of like this interesting things. So this is part of this series and um, it's a very different kind of tone than my other poem. So just so you know. Um, okay. Um, Laurel Creek, a stream courses through the consonants containing our walls. Before we entered the Second World War, her father walked here after school 
from train stop, a dirt road past the county hospital, a good job gardener on a dairy farm, Anglo's managed Portuguese owner from the Azor mother told her, grandmother's people. The only grassland now is the school's field around the block. The youngest climbs chain links, straddles concrete culvert over the creek's cool slime. Bay laurel musk, she squats pollywogs swim past, asphalt in homes now grid pastures, El Camino to coastal hills. In the prefab library, its floors hollow to footstep, she dwells on what's below foundations, why her father didn't recognize where he came back. Winter, the first floor heat duck puffs her nightgown, blows a paper mache bird in circles, its round sienna body, pink wings and breasts, Sump pump growls under children's feet, rattles mason jars. Her father once pulled dairy weeds, ate a sack lunch creekside, left for college, then war. State claimed eminent domain, school and housing in 1946. This dairy owner was still deployed. He couldn't dispute the worth. He's still bitter as the wild grasses, as his great uncle who lost fingers to a mowing machine. In 1973, when her father plants an apple and pear tree close to their property line, the ailing dairyman next door won't guarantee that he won't shoot at whatever grows onto his side. Her father digs again. Whoever planted the walnut, the yellow plum, mission fig, weeping willow, apple grafted two varieties from months of harvest, Whatever remained around the farm hand's house sold in the late 50s, hoisted in 64 to make a second story. A house moved east-west highway, became first floor. Two families lived here eight years, packed up five car frames, a goat, left a sink mounted with no drain. It's affordable housing in suburbia. Her family moves in, the door falls off. Parents haul bookcase to divide the kitchen from the dining room, a couch as a living room edge. Each child chooses a small room, no more fighting. The blackboard left nailed to a hall wall, she listens by. She runs by and listens for a skeleton behind it. Before dairy fields, before Rancho de las Polgas, she asks her mother between library books. They only find how to cook acorn mush, bitter unless soaked. In the kitchen, they try it, and she reports back to her first grade class and asks, where the Indians are. Her brother teases, dig through the world, the back side of pits in the Ukraine. He pulls her hair. Her mother keeps the children from funerals, keeps them busy. Her mother slides a triangle along a straight edge, fixes the gaps in the redesign where stories come together above a doorway out, a long shelf, a full mattress fitted to afternoon sun. Her mother pivots a, com a compass and she sits next to her 
spinning on the high chair, tall enough to be her mother's friend. A paper mache bird hangs still during summers. The, homes, the house is cooler than the morning sun. She sits on a cement driveway, newspaper unfolded, headline funnies, want ad columns. Her brown hair shines red, catches eyes of an older couple. The woman lets go. Her husband's bony hand turns away. She's your father's second cousin, her mother says. They live around the block. Her husband held an arm across the doorway we went to go visit. No one can say why. Another summer, the widow of the dairy owner, a recluse next door knocks. She asks for her father. The telephone's out. Neighbors, wide smile and dyed hair. Her poised height makes the girl want to know her more. That's it. Very good. Excellent. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, what a poem. Uh, I'm speechless. Anyway, let's uh, move on to Amy, please. Uh, thank you so much again, Sharon. That was lovely. Amy Sosa. Beautiful, Sharon. Um, thank you. So uh, I'm going to read, I guess I have a few poems and then I have one short story that's very short that I might read depending on how much time I have. Uh, and the first one is a work in progress. Everything for me is a work in progress. Uh, and almost everything is a little bit 2020 related because it was a really hard year. Um, yeah, so this one doesn't have a title yet. Anyway, um, a childhood surrounded by water, Mayflower offspring, Azorian pioneers. I didn't belong anywhere. In the city of cobblestone streets, widow's walks top whaling captain's homes. Down the block from Moby Dick Marine Specialties and a museum dedicated to the mammal so cruelly exploited. While my cousins roamed all over, I grew up mostly alone, exploring every corner, seeking treasure. There was always a line for donuts, always a thin blue sky. One cousin owned a shop where I bought my mother a present, a miniature cast iron pan, fake antique, embossed with a man's silhouette, maybe a pilgrim, he wore that crazy hat. She used it to hold spoons while she cooked from that day on. Where did I get the money and why did I buy that? When my sister packed my mother's house and shipped me boxes and bags to sort through, she included every towel my mother ever owned, but not the pilgrim spoon rest. Its iron coating had faded over 40 years, and to some it looked like junk. No one knew what it meant, except my mother and me. Um, this one is called My Loneliness Evaporates. It could also just be called 2020. <laughs> um, Middle Street belongs to us. I break my mom out of the nursing home and we endure the pandemic together. Moo tip-tapping on Sandy Paws. I don't hate my sister for selling the house without asking because it doesn't happen. Friends text me back. Dad's reel-to-reels appear in the basement and I can hear tiny me singing. While we're at it, I redo a few things from childhood and beyond. My brother lets me into his life. I stall death for my most beloved. We walk on the beach collecting milky glass and sharp shells. At night we go to the arcade and every game is ours. Um, this next one is called, A Whole is Worth More Than Its Parts. A stranger on my lawn wears pandemic gloves to pick through my mother's linens. The rest go downtown to a shelter where a man holds the door in case something happens, 
It gets a little weird down here, he says. A little, a second man laughs. But I don't feel scared, only lost at depositing five black bags holding my mother's life. Sheets that she bought to cheer her up. Blankets my dog loved. Pillows from every room. Everyday items that can break a heart and make me feel off kilter. My mother's house in pieces is junk that needs attention when together it's spelled home. Vanished and won't return no matter how hard I need it back. Wow. Um, thank you. Uh, getting off of the family and death trail. <laughs> this one's called The River in Me. Um, the River in Me. The first time I was a river, I dried up. The next time I overflowed. Neither time could I figure out why, which forces imposed themselves upon me, what reason, what pattern. As a river, I learned to abide, though that took time. I had thought before becoming one that rivers held sway, that they carried landscapes, not the other way around. I thought as a river, I'd be in control, and then I dried up, and then I flowed over. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I run a project called Spark, and uh, it's where artists and writers will um, trade work and it becomes, they use each other's work as, as prompts, basically as an inspiration piece. So these next two pieces were written um, for Spark, as part of Spark, uh, and so they were prompted by other people's artwork. Um, this piece is called Butterfly, and it was prompted by this amazing I don't even know what it is. It's like a felted uh, piece of art with a butterfly coming into a, um, a blue flower. Butterflies don't worry about attachment when they wrestle away the cocoon and soar wispy but not frail. The woman who discovered their life cycle was ridiculed by men who knew better, even though they were wrong. She painted and drew, explored and listened, watched insects hatch, and must have thought she had witnessed God's hand. At 52, she traveled the Caribbean to consider mysterious creatures. Today, I read that women over 50 disappear to those around them, near and far, ceasing to exist. Imagine the oldest butterfly living hundreds of times longer than most of its species. The stories it could tell, shrewd flap to its wings, going in for nectar with sureness, history pulsing through its genes, unconcerned about your lack of knowledge, if it noticed you at all. Um, and then this, I'll just read this one, I'm assuming I have time. Uh, yep, one short uh, story that I wrote for Spark in response to um, a strange sort of four paneled photo uh, by a woman named Pippa Possible. And this is called Plain Sight. After my father died, my mother stopped opening mail. Cards, bills, magazines, junk. All of it sat untouched for months until one day the pile disappeared. I don't know if she read any of it. Last year, I found myself doing the same. I couldn't bear to look at anything the postman delivered and I only paid bills when collectors called. Meanwhile, the man next door kept working on his truck. He trimmed trees and smoked a pipe, acting as if the world hadn't stopped. Months earlier, when I still opened mail, the man's elderly mother fell off her porch on the way to an already full recycling bin, a bag of bottles breaking around her. When I ran over to help, a wall of old beer smell rushed me back to childhood and so I attended to my neighbor as half me, half young me. The sour smell almost did me in. We seemed surrounded by too many empties for one frail elder, but I knew better. I knew secrets. I had never seen the woman drink anything, and I knew that meant nothing. 
Her knees were skinned and bleeding as she crawled in her bathroom back up the cement stairs. I hunted jaggy glass thrown across the patio. She sat on the top step and plucked slivers from the bottoms of her feet. I should have called a doctor, but she insisted no. And I had learned long ago how to ignore the logical. The woman's son was out at sea with no way to reach him and she wouldn't let me help her get back inside the house. Everything about her reeked of beer and my brain flipped to an image it sometimes displayed. My father at the ballpark, pouring two liter-sized cups of liquid down his throat like an impossible cartoon because he thought I was still at the concession stand and couldn't see him. I turned away then and never said a word, but his hunger and desperation etched into me, still there 30 years later. While I time traveled, my neighbor returned to her house and clicked the door lock into place, reinstating proper distance between us. I knew enough not to knock or try to check on her. Instead, I walked home to find a garbage bag for broken glass, tucked still whole bottles into her bin for late night seekers. I had no idea what awaited me in just a few months time and that I would soon stop opening mail. Now the woman is gone, moved into a home, her son calls her Joanne, never mom. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful story as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sharon. And uh, we'll move to British Columbia. How's that? To uh, Esmeralda. Thank you. Um... Yes, hard act to follow. I forgot to say that um, I write creative nonfiction, and, but I've always wanted to be a poet. <laughs> so uh, here I am following two uh, poets. Thank you. Um, so I have recently uh, completed a memoir, which I've called How to Clean a Fish. And uh, I thought I'd read an excerpt for you today. And just as um, a way of background, a few years ago, um, my husband was on sabbatical from his university job here in Vancouver, and he went to work at an institute in Costa de Caparica across the river from Lisbon. So we all went with him, and um, therein lies the basis of the memoir uh, that I wrote. Um, so I'd like to read the short excerpt today from a chapter called Tracking the Passport. Uh, and just so you know, there there was a problem with my husband's work visa, as in he forgot to apply for one. Um, and the only way around it, once we got to Portugal, was for him to send his passport in the mail to Vancouver, have the consul issue the work visa, and then send it back to, uh, to us in Portugal, uh, which was fine, a little unnerving, but it was fine. But in the meantime, Eric's mother died in Canada and he needed to go to Canada for her funeral. And let's see, what else can I tell you? Eric does not speak Portuguese. So here it goes. I arrived back home around four o'clock. One look at Eric's face and I could tell he didn't have the passport yet. What happened? I asked, feeling the anxiety rise in my chest. Where's the passport? It hasn't arrived yet. I've been here all day and I haven't even seen the mailman, Eric replied. I've tracked the package online and it says that it's in the delivery van and will be delivered today. As the afternoon drew to a close, our panic grew. We usually saw the letter carrier around two o'clock. We lived on the ground floor of an up-down duplex and when the neighbor upstairs came home from work, she came to give us our mail that had been put in her box by mistake. There among the flyers and junk mail was a postal delivery card. I read it out loud and gasped when I saw that it said the delivery of a package had been attempted, but since no one was home, we could claim it from the post office on Monday morning. It was Friday and Eric's flight was on Sunday, his mother's funeral on Monday. But Eric was home, I don't understand, I said to her almost in tears. What, what, what is it as? Eric was desperate to know what was going on. I explained the note to him in English, and at the same time, the neighbor was speaking to me in Portuguese. Maybe he didn't realize the bottom floor is occupied now, the neighbor said. 
And you know, she continued, sometimes they don't feel like walking around with packages. So they just put the cards in our mailboxes and then we have to go pick up the packages ourselves. I've noticed they're doing that a lot more lately. I'd heard friends complain about similar things back home in Vancouver, but this was strange. This man had delivered mail to our box already since we'd lived here. It's Friday, she said. He probably wanted to go home. We didn't have much time to ponder what happened and why. We had to get to the post office. I ran inside to get the car keys. Eric got in the car. The neighbor opened the gate and led us out of the driveway. We sped down the narrow cobblestone streets to the post office and arrived just as the clerk was knock locking the door. I jumped out of the car and ran up to her. She must have recognized me. I'd been in there three times in the last week to ship large packages of books to Canada. I knocked on the glass door and she unlocked it, smiling. This was unusual. In my past dealings with her, I had found her to be helpful and efficient, but a little detached and not exactly what I would call friendly. At that moment, though, I was grateful for her smile. She opened the door to let us in. I explained our situation, the angst obvious from the shaking in my voice. Oh, my condolences, she said, but I can't help you here. We don't get the packages until Monday. You need to go to the distribution center and you'll have to hurry, they close soon. In fact, best to leave your car here. With this traffic, you have a better chance of making it there if you walk, or better yet, run. I could see the sympathy on her face. In Portugal, the death of a mother is one of life's most significant events, especially for a son. I sensed that she understood our anguish. We arrived at the distribution center in the industrial part of town, sweaty and breathless. It was dusk now and hard to see exactly where to go, but we did spot a windowless squat building at one end of a large parking lot that was lined with postal vehicles. There was a large metal delivery door at the far end of the building and we ran up to it. Eric pounded on it, but it felt futile. There was nobody around. Who would hear us? I pounded too, but when our hands started to burn from pounding so hard, we gave up and sat on the stoop, overcome with helplessness. A few minutes later, the door opened and a woman asked what we were doing there. She was maybe in her early thirties, but her face looked drawn. She had bushy eyebrows and dark circles beneath her tired looking eyes. She had a calm, disinterested demeanor. I explained our situation once more. She said that she was very sorry, but she would not be able to help us. The driver was not yet back. And sometimes on the weekends, they just take the under, undelivered packages home and take them straight to the post office on Monday morning. I pleaded with her, can you call the driver, please? No, no, I can't. If he's driving, he won't be able to answer. And if he's home already, he'll have turned off his phone. Can you not try? I was starting to sound exasperated. Eric took my arm by the elbow and said, it's fine, yes, there's not much more we can do. We tried. We turned and walked away. I could not believe it. She stood at the door and watched us. And when we were about to turn the corner, she yelled out, Espera. If you want, you can wait here and see if he comes back. In the meantime, I'll try to raise him on the phone. Please tell your husband that I'm very sorry for his mother's death. Obrigada, I said shut the door and left us sitting on the stoop. I turned to Eric and said, isn't that what I asked her to do in the first place? I know, I know, but at least there's a bit of hope now, he said, comforting me. It really should have been me comforting him at that particular moment. Why does everything have to be so hard here? I said, and I started to cry. We must have made quite the sight. Two people in the dark sitting on the stoop of a warehouse door in a big parking lot, me holding my head in my hands, Eric with his arm around me. We sat in silence and checked our watches frequently. There was nothing more we could say to each other. After about 15 long minutes, we saw a small white van pull into the lot and park next to another van identical to, the, to his. A man got out and grabbed a canvas bag from the back seat. He looked tired. I could almost feel his relief that his work day had come to an end. We greeted him as if he was our long lost friend. Hello, hello. We waved and walked toward him. He looked surprised to see us, but he kept walking. 
we're looking for a package. It's my husband's passport and he needs it because his mother died and he has to go to the funeral and his flight leaves on Sunday. I was talking fast, desperate to get all the information out before he walked through that metal door. I can't give you anything from my bag. You have to pick it up from the post office on Monday morning, he said. My exasperation got the better of me and I blurted out, did you not hear me? The package contains the passport that my husband needs to fly on Sunday. He kept walking and I shouted, to his mother's funeral. Eric pulled me close. You're getting carried away, he whispered in my ear. I took a deep breath. What I really wanted to do was shout at the letter carrier and call him an idiot for putting the card in the wrong box in the first place. Sir, with all due respect, I said more calmly, you delivered the package to the wrong address, or maybe you didn't deliver it at all, just put the card in our neighbor's box. Maybe you didn't come to our door. I know this because my husband was home all day waiting for you. And then I added, I hope you can understand that he needs this package today, now. The man ignored me and focused his eyes on Eric, stretched out his hand for a greeting and said, my sympathies, sir. Then he opened his bag and the first package he removed was Eric's. Just then the door to the building opened and the same woman as before stood there, arms crossed. Oh, so you know the situation, she said, addressing her colleague as if we were not even there. And then she turned to Eric and said in English, you need to show identification. Oh yes, of course, Eric said and pulled out his wallet. He showed her his British Columbia driver's license. She turned to me and said in Portuguese, this is foreign identification. I cannot accept it. That's all he has, I said. He is a foreigner. What would you like him to show you? I'm going to need to see his passport before I can give your husband this package, she said. I imagine that she was enjoying this power she had over us at that moment, but she was not showing any glee. She was, she was not acknowledging the rid ridiculous nature of the situation either. Her face showed the same indifference she'd been, wear she'd been wearing during our entire exchange. I can't remember exactly what happened next, except that she did allow Eric to open the package. And then she held out her hand and asked him to give it to her. She removed the passport, opened it up to check the photo and made sure the name matched the one on the envelope. And then she said, Good thing you were telling me the truth. Safe travels, Senor Eric. When we got home, we sat down at the dining room table, suddenly aware that we hadn't said a word to each other all the way home. Eric opened a bottle of red wine, Tuella, our favorite, and grabbed two glasses while I examined the passport. I turned to the page with work visa on it, and the first thing I saw was that the date was wrong. The visa would expire two months before departure, our, before our departure. I didn't say anything, but I felt nauseous. Eric could fly to Toronto on Sunday, and that was a relief. But our passport woes were not over. Thank you. Oh, how I can relate to a lot of that. <laughs> <clears throat> Those who know Portugal. Uh, and very well written and poetic, by the way. No. <laughs> uh, thank you. And so we will uh, now go to Lynette. Wow, I'm still kind of stressed from that story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we need to have an anthology with Avoa poems. Uh, mm. I didn't bring mine today, but we all have one. So anyways, I'll start with this immigrant my father wakes me before he combs his monster under the bed hair. My father standing solidly like an Italian sausage. He opens his red, green, gold mouth, mouth of the dried pimento hanging near the curing linguisa, mouth of the nina, the pinta, the Santa Maria. His tongue is the Portuguese flag telling me it's time to pray. Tongue of a guppy, tongue like my brother's pop gun, subtitle tongue. 
My father has eyes of the stained glass rosette in Saint Chapelle, eyes of the Empire State Building, eyes filled with the New York Harbor and its torch. My father with hands round the rosary, his tsunami hands, purple hands, Sistine Chapel hands, hands of clay, nails, and terracotta tiles. My father with the voice of the Ave Maria, of the Matina, the voice of Hiroshima, voice of being chosen last, voice of being team captain. My father with the voice of a cement mixer, voice of the great amen. My father with feet of the Olympian, running around shells in Sarajevo, feet washed by God, feet of the raped, feet of the Bosnian, the Nazi, the Jew, double bone feet. I am afraid of my father's anger, my father with the anger of a box cutter carried in the deep green pocket of a drugstore stock boy, afraid of my father by the graveyard, afraid of my father's mourning, his scurvy mourning, mourning of the Winchester mystery house, coat hanger mourning, the mourning of a comic strip character, mourning in ashes like the day after the fire, my father's mourning like the glass of Porto that spills late at night. And then I'll read a much lighter Pro, uh, poem since we're in Fresno. This is called Faux Fresno. The Ting Tings are playing on the faux vintage record player. She swipes right, right, right into your 50 year old arms. Somehow your bottom feeding settings scooped up a 36 year old with fire red hair. You chat at San Francisco girl and she says she's in Fresno, says it's the COVID, says she's with her mama taking care, but this Fresno reeks of catfish, Nigerian princes, swamp real estate, Bitcoin blackmail, masturbation scams. In her powder blue room, she has hung huge paper blooms of flowers made from wallpaper that she sells on Etsy. She's looking for pandemic love, fruit fly love, tick love, till jaws of death do us part love. It's so easy for you to click unmatch. Ting Ting's track two side A starts. That's not my name. She sighs and picks up Tinder again tenderly. And then Denise, I'm gonna ask you to read with me if you're still willing. I am, I am, I'm honored. Great. So this was actually written in uh, Disquiet, and it's a bilingual poem. So Denise will read uh, the Portuguese with me. Uh, Sima is the name of, actually, here's a little bit of an Avoa poem. This is the street my grandmother lived on. Sima. Here is the woman who walked into the sea. Aqui está a mulher que entrou no mar. Here are rosary beads, paint worn away. Aqui estão as contas de um rosário com tinta já desaparecida. Cut open my spleen. Rasga-me o baço. Find what is left of the white house. Descobre o que resta da casa branca. Walk to the armoire covered in dust, pigeons resting on top. Anda até ao armário coberto de poeira, pombos poisados em cima. Find a lock of blonde hair wrapped in tissue. Descobre um punhado de cabelo louro num embrulho de papel. Find the black scarves. Descobre os, casco os cascóis negros. Black as tilled earth, black as bile. Negros como a terra lavrada, negro como a bilis. Here is the trunk of a man who never became a priest. Aqui está o tronco de um homem que nunca se tornou padre. 
Here's the trunk of a man who never was a boy. Aqui está o tronco de um homem que nunca foi criança. Here are the blue hydrangeas, the belt that beat the children, the green of kale in watery soup. Aqui estão as hortências azuis, o cinto que bateu nas crianças, o verde da couve na sopa deslavada. Here are the women who didn't marry, the men who built bridges, the whale teeth carved into lace. Aqui estão as mulheres que não casaram, os homens que construíram pontes, os dentes da baleia talhados em renda. Here are the scales left unbalanced by mud. Aqui estão as balanças deixadas em desequilíbrio pela lama. Find it here in my disquiet. Encontra aqui no meu desassossego. A minha casa é um sítio onde nunca vivi. Home is a place I've never lived. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. And thank you, uh, thank you for the opportunity to read in Portuguese. Uh, it's my favorite language. Uh, so uh, it's um, uh, poems, poems sound great in all languages, but there's something about it in Portuguese. Uh, so thanks, thank you all. Uh, thanks so much for participating. We should have a little bit of a conversation. And if any of you are following us um, uh, here, uh, can uh, go ahead and uh, ask any questions or any special comments that you'd like to make um, that you want to share publicly, we'd be more happy to. So um, first and foremost, thank you all. Uh, great readings, great poems, great stories. Um, and, um, and, I, and I think that indeed, as Lynette mentioned, maybe we should have an anthology on uh, on, on poems for a vault. Uh, and it probably should have a preface by Carlo. And, uh, and he probably would like to title it, write a poem about a vault. Don't write any poems about a vault. And so, uh, because uh, we actually had that conversation not too long ago when we talked about the anthology that him and Luis uh, put together that includes lots of your work as well. Um, uh, here uh, now, quite a few years ago, and we actually talked about the possibility of uh, having another anthology. Um, one of the things that I'm working on just to share with everybody, and some of you know about that, which is um, the, the Azores has a wonderful uh, uh, collection of writers. I mean, we have writers for a, for a region with only 250,000 people, actually less than that now, uh, about 248,000. Uh, the Azores right now has about anywhere between 30 to 40 excellent published writers. I mean, it's just it's just magnificent, uh, you know, for a region, you know, not many cities in the United States or Canada with a population of less than 250 have such a vibrant community. Um, and uh, and, 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 and then last year, um, there were over uh, 60 books published, you know, just by one of the publishers, Letras Lavadas, not to talk about the others, Compañía de Zidas, and a couple others. So there's this rich uh, literary tradition in the Azores that I see that all of you carried on uh, here in the United States and Canada. And um, it is needed to one of the uh, things that we need, I believe, in the Azores in the Portuguese speaking world is to, is to have access to more of your work those of you who write in English. Um, and so I've been working on an anthology that is an anthology about Azorian uh, poets um, from Antero do Quintal all the way up to some of the contemporaries. It's gonna be called Into the Azorian Sea, but it will be a little bit different. I, I want to include, and I'm gonna be talking to each and every one of you, your poems as well, because it, to me, the Azorian poetry is not limited to the islands. To me, the Azorian writing and, we, and short stories and creative writing is not, the Azorian literature is much richer if it includes all of your works, whether it be in poetry, uh, fiction, nonfiction, et cetera. So um, indeed, I think that the Azores, and we, see, and we saw that in all of your writings, uh, the Azores, Portugal, and, uh, and uh, how they're present in whatever um, it, it is, uh, even if it's not a very Azorian poem, 
there are what I was uh, talking today with a fellow a colleague at the University of the Azores, which is there are pinceladas, you know, uh, there are paint brushes, you know, there are brush, there are pieces of paint that are that are intertwined in what you write. And so I wanted to ask each and every one of you a little a first question, which is, and we'll start um, basically the same order that we did the reading. So we'll start with Sharon. Sharon, um, uh, uh, of course, other than uh, of all, uh, how how much of uh, of uh, being Portuguese uh, has shaped some of your writing? Um, being of Portuguese background, I should say. Yeah, my grandmother's family were extraordinary storytellers. Um, my grandmother um, had stories that she would tell constantly and stories of stories that, um, her, her father would tell and her, her, and all of her extended family. So, you know, I feel that, um, that kind of the storytelling, the narrative is very much part of me and, um, um, and, um, I mean, we tell stories in different ways. She very much, Mm, she liked to say, yeah, when um, my great grandfather had a hotel in Calistoga and she pretty much ran it during the um, influenza epidemic and she would have stories about that and about men who would get in trouble with their wives and always like told you so kind of stories. <laughs> um, and I'm more in the surreal vein of things. Um, so um, yeah, so that that runs very deep in me. Sure. That rich tradition of storytelling, uh, which is in lots of different cultures, but also uh, certainly in, in, in the Portuguese and Azorean as well. Yes, yeah. indeed. And, um, and uh, so, uh, Amy, uh, uh, how much of that Portuguese connection uh, ties into what you write on? A, and you write, of course, about uh, different topics as well. But what, yeah. how much is that? Um, I, I think Shape what's interesting is being Portuguese, Portuguese American, absolutely shapes everything about me. Um, it is I can't I can't get away from it. I'll never get away from it. I don't want to. But um, you know, growing up in New Bedford, well, I grew up in Dartmouth, and I don't know how much you know about that area, but I grew up in like, I mean, really, I was surrounded by Mayflower people. You know, we were for a while like the only Portuguese people on the block. So there was a lot of tension between like that very white and being Portuguese like when you're when you live in that area you're either white or you're Portuguese do you know what I mean like it's it's a uh, you're not white when you're there if you're Portuguese I, and, and I a lot of people don't understand that um and it's certainly not true any other part of the country I don't think but uh like I just I don't think I can I don't think anything can come out of me that's not informed by having grown up as a Portuguese American um yeah I, I, i'll leave it so it, it's part of what you write whether it's something you know family or not family it's part of uh, your idiosyncratic way of being you know it's yeah it's who you yeah. are and yeah and i'll just say that i finally started to learn portuguese in february i've got a portuguese tutor um who was born in new bedford but is actually she her parents were from portugal they moved to new bedford had her then they moved back to portugal now she lives here um, she's wonderful. I'm finally learning the language. I understood, you know, like 30% of what you said, Dinesh, and and that was, I'm so happy about it. Wonderful, wonderful. You'll be writing in Portuguese soon, hopefully. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, no, please, please. Uh, and uh, Esmeralda, of course, uh, in your situation as an immigrant, you have a little bit, such as myself, you know, you were very young. I think you said you were seven when you immigrated. I was I was 10. And so it was, um, you know, we kind of have that duality of both worlds, it seems like. Um, and of course, in your uh, in your short story, you touched a lot of different uh, in your in your mm. in, in that uh, memoir of, of touch a lot of different themes that are so Portuguese that, you know, it could it happened in the mail service, but they're very Portuguese in in very ways. And of course, you did an outstanding job in 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 uh, in bringing out uh, without, um, without overdoing it and bringing out, you know, some of the dilemmas and, and how they are part of, you know, a country's culture, but at the same time, you know, how, uh, you being Portuguese were not the calm one and the Canadian <laughs> one was the calm, was the calm and the one that needed. So, uh, but, uh, a little bit about, you know, 
someone who came at such, at such a young age and adapting, of course, to North America, to, to Canada, um, how has, how has, you know, connecting with your roots, how is continuing of your roots here you know, shaped your writing as well? Well, I think, like Amy said, I mean, I'm Portuguese and it's everything about me, really. So it's hard for me to, to separate those two. But I have to say, when I'm in Canada, I feel very Portuguese. You know, I'm the, the, the passionate one and the loud one. And, you know, and, uh, but when I go to Portugal, I feel very Canadian. Um, so trying to understand that duality is is an ongoing experience for me. And um, yeah, I write a lot about my immigration experience, even though I, I came as a young child. But um, I have so I came with my mom and dad and one of my two sisters. Uh, my oldest sister was in Lisbon at the time we came. And so the four of us came to Canada and now those the three other people my mother my father and one of my sisters um they've all passed away so i feel like i'm the keeper of our immigration stories and i feel a responsibility to pass that on to to my children if nobody else but um yeah it feels it feels a little bit strange to be you know like i have no fact checkers um i i can't really bounce things off the others to say was it really like this um so that's why I, I, I need to write those stories down. Um, Please do. There's not enough of them written. And unfortunately, with the, and it's great that you're writing it because it seems like the immigrant experience sometimes is not written. And of course, when we talk about the prior generations, you know, I think, mm. uh, thank goodness that, you know, Sharon, Amy, Lynette and others are writing, you know, f the, the, the stories from their parents and their grandparents and great grandparents experiences, because a lot of that generation did not you know, write down or, exactly. but there was that rich oral tradition as Sharon mentioned. Yeah, indeed, continue writing, please. And uh, Lynette, your, your Portuguese American experience, of course, uh, and uh, from the, the aspect of having uh, uh, of the Azores and, and Madeira involved in it, which is, uh, which is kind of a, a minority in California anyway, and the West Coast, you know, being from Madeira is, a, is kind of a minority within the Portuguese American community. Yes, and my dear friend from school is uh, is of the same mixture. I see her on the chat. So hi, Lisa. Um, I agree with Amy. Just um, growing up, it's such a part of your identity. And I find that I'm really interested in writing from first generation, whatever that culture is, because you're not fully American. You're not fully Portuguese, right? So there's this this other place of being that I think is really interesting. It's this viewpoint that's not fully here, not fully there. And um, I related a lot to what Esmeralda said about uh, when I'm traveling abroad, I'm so American. And, but when I'm here, I'm, I'm Portuguese. I've got my flag over here, see? So even my students see my Portuguese flag every day. Um, so I, I think um, I don't always write about Portuguese topics, but it's always there. So even in my memoir that's about Thailand, there's a story about Portugal because it informed who I was and some of my values. So yeah, I think it's really important. Indeed. Uh, so we're going to uh, end our session. And I want to thank each and every one of you again. Thanks to all the nice comments. Thanks to those of you who are following us on social media. We'll have also this on our YouTube channel as well. And uh, it will be part of the uh, California Portuguese American Oral History Project at Fresno State. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll, all of you will continue writing, telling those experiences, whether they are immigrant, first generation, second, third, fourth, fifth generation. I will uh, just end it with a couple of the thoughts. And one of them is I like told this story. Some people have heard it before. Um, I teach Portuguese at, uh, and have for uh, too long, probably, but um, I am um, now semi-retired and it allows me to do uh, what I want to do and need to do at Fresno State in order to have this, uh, we have the blessing of the administration. Uh, the university president is a Portuguese professor, and that helps. Uh, Hispanic who taught Portuguese, uh, who actually did his studies um, uh, in, in Portuguese and, and Spanish literature, and who is one of the specialists in Camões. And he, um, and Professor uh, 
Saul Jimenez Sandoval is a very strong supporter of everything that we do to have Fresno State be kind of the hub of everything that is Portuguese in the West Coast. And that includes, of course, uh, the literary world. And so we want to archive, we want to publish, we want to research as much as we can with the Portuguese presence, whether it be in California, whether it be in British Columbia, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Oregon, where we have a growing community and in, and in Washington state as well, Idaho and some other areas. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear those of you who are of second, third, fourth generation and your stories, uh, of course, uh, about uh, the, uh, the Portuguese American experience. Um, I, as a Portuguese language teacher, one of the things that you do, especially at the community college level, where I taught also for many years, is um, you, you, you try to teach a couple of words in your first session to the, to the students. Most of them don't know any Portuguese, so basic intros and uh, uh, saying what their name is, chamou-me or, my, or meu nome, whatever it is in Portuguese. And then they tell me uh, at a community college, those of you who know the, the concept, of course, we get a lot of students in my class was in the evening because I had a day job uh, teaching <laughs> elsewhere. And so we, um, we get students from all walks of life. Uh, you know, like uh, one of my, the eldest students I had was an 84 year old lady, a uh, lovely lady who was born uh, here in the States, Portuguese parents, uh, also born here, but her grandmother kind of raised her and her grandmother, she spoke Portuguese from the age of five until she married someone and left the area at the age of 18 and had forgotten the language. And it was her first language and she had forgotten it. So it happens. But um, John Gorbowski, I'll never forget because he introduced himself as my name is John Gorbowski and I am taking Portuguese because I'm Portuguese, I'm an Azorian. And I, you know, kidding with John, I said, yeah, we have Garbaskis all over, all the Frexias, all the villages in the Azores have a Garbaski or two. Um, and he had a, a good sense of humor, you know, uh, and, um, and he, he answered this, no, I'm Portuguese. My Volvelinha on my mom's side was from Saint Georges. Volvelinha is a term that we use, a term of endearment for great grandmother, bisavo. And, and so finding out later, you know, this young man had uh, Polish, obviously, uh, from his father's side, Native American, Irish, German, and Portuguese. He identified with being Portuguese, so there must be something there. And so these stories must continue. Um, the power of the ancestors uh, must continue with us. Thank you all for doing that. And I'm going to end it with a quote from a book that I've just finished reading by Total different topic, but it's Clint Smith who wrote a, a wonderful book called How the Word is Past. Uh, it's about the history of slavery across the United America. And he writes, and I quote, my grandparents' stories are my inheritance. Each one is a heirloom I carry. Each one is a monument to an era that still courses through my grandfather's veins. Each story is a memorial that still sits in my grandmother's bones. My grandparents' voices are a museum, and I'm still learning how to, a museum that I'm still learning how to visit. Each conversation with them, a new exhibit worthy of my time. So thank you all for going, reaching out to those grandma poems and to the Avo poems and to the, in your family tradition and your family heritage. Uh, thanks to uh, all of those who followed us here and uh, continue writing and, uh, cont and we are here to help in any way we can. And Hopefully we will all see each other in person very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you for your writing. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank it. Have a good so night, much. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.